Disclaimer. These videos are meant to be a brief overview of the subject. They are written to meet time constraints while still conveying factual historical information. My sources for each video are in the video summary below and can get you started on a more in-depth look at the subject. On a personal note, if there is a way to mispronounce the name, I will do it. It is a gift and I am sorry about it ahead of time. Welcome to Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition. Today we're going to talk about the Battle of Fredericksburg, located on Spotsylvania County, Virginia, on December 11th to the 15th, 1862. U.S. Major General George B. McClellan was fired from his position as commander of the Union forces. In his place, General Ambrose E. Burnside took over and the strategy of the Union was going to be changed as well. Burnside rearranged his army into four greater divisions. One of those commanded by U.S. Major General Edwin B. Sumner started his portion of the upcoming fight by arriving at Fredericksburg on November 17, 1862. The plan was to cross the Rappahannock by Pontoon Bridge and attack Fredericksburg before the Confederate Army under Robert E. Lee could return. Arriving, Sumner saw a chance to cross without the bridges and just attack, but Burnside worried that the crossing would become impassable after they had moved, thus trapping Sumner on the other side. So Burnside ordered the army to stop and Sumner waited. Unfortunately, the Union Army was unable to get the pontoon bridges to Sumner in time and Lee had returned before the army could make its move. Lee meant to stop Sumner's forces by having several smaller Confederate divisions under these returning generals of Richard H. Anderson, Lafayette McClaws, George Pickett, John Bell Hood, and General Robert Ransom Jr. array their forces in front of Sumner across the water in Fredericksburg. The Battle of Fredericksburg began on December 11th as Union engineers built and then used six pontoon bridges to cross the river. They were spread out at various landing sites near the city and were quickly built. Unfortunately for the Union, the dawn revealed the engineers building the bridges too soon. The bridges nearest the city came under a withering fire from Confederate defenders that were made up from Mississippi and Florida volunteers. These men were under the command of Confederate General William Barksdale. Burnside was horrified by this and ordered four hours of Union artillery to pound the Confederate troops in Fredericksburg. More than 150 cannons fired over 8,000 artillery shells into the town. This didn't seem to stop the Confederates who unleashed more rifle fire into the engineers when they took up the construction again. In desperation, volunteers from New York, Michigan, and Massachusetts crossed the river by the pontoon boats themselves and engaged the Confederate forces the remainder of the day. By nightfall, the Confederate forces withdrew Fredericksburg, allowing engineers to continue the build and for the town of Fredericksburg to fall to Burnside. However, this was not the end of the battle. Burnside did not realize that this was part of the Confederate plan. The Confederates did not intend to keep Fredericksburg, but instead lure the Union Army past the town and against the already prepared Confederate positions. On December 12th, the rest of the Union Army crossed the river. It is reported the reason the army didn't move past the town itself that day was due to wanton vandalism and the looting of the town itself. During this downtime, Burnside realized he was going to face the entirety of Lee's army and ordered a plan to assault Hamilton's Crossing and Mary's Heights on the next day on the 13th. Union General Franklin and his 6,000 men were tasked with attacking Stonewall Jackson's force at Hamilton Crossing. It should be noted that General Franklin balked at the idea and only sent 4,500 men to attack Stonewall Jackson. This was less than 10% of his army. Under the command of Meade, the Union troops moved quickly on the 13th. After 8 a.m., his men utilized the fog to cross the Richmond State Road and began for their target at Hamilton's Crossing. Their forward movement stopped when Confederate artillery began bracketing his men to their left and behind them. The Confederate artillery was commanded by Confederate Major John Pelham. This was done when Pelham had moved two guns up to Meade's flank and opened fire at close range. Pelham ignored orders to retreat until he ran out of all of his ammunition. It was only then that he pulled his men back. The Union line began moving forward again, and then when it were within 800 yards, once again Confederate artillery, this time all the guns in the area, targeted and ripped apart the Union line. The Union soldiers immediately sought cover from there while the Union artillery returned fire. One of the Confederate ammunition carts blew up and alerted the Union army. Meade ordered his men to focus on that area, and they charged what they believed were Confederate artillery. They found something better, one part of the Confederate defense that wasn't guarded, a hole in the Confederate lines about 600 yards wide. The Union troops quickly moved and eventually came across Confederate General Maxi Gregg's South Carolina Brigade. Meade's men pushed through these Confederates as word of the attack reached Confederate General Jackson, and he began to organize a devastating counterattack. Meade saw the buildup of troops and immediately ordered his men to pull back to the Richmond Stage Road. Meanwhile, the Union was learning why the Confederates had pulled back and given up the town. Confederate artillery was sweeping through the lines of Union troops. The Confederates had measured and sighted the entire area, 
and used that knowledge to devastating effect when they called in artillery. Meanwhile, Confederate Brigadier General Thomas R. Cobb's men prepared for the Union move forward in a sunken road and stone wall, waiting them at Mary's Heights. The original Union plan was for Meade to push forward, and once he had successfully made his goal, then a second wave of Union troops would go after Mary's Heights. Burnside knew that Meade was being hampered and had not yet succeeded. However, Burnside ordered the second part of the attack to occur anyways, without waiting for Meade. The results were disastrous, as the Union forces under command of U.S. Major Generals Darius N. Couch, Daniel Butterfield, Orlando B. Wilcox, and Amiel W. Whipple's divisions began moving forward to the sunken road. As they moved west towards Mary's Heights, they had come across more than 400 yards of open field. The Confederate artillery fire was pure murder on the Union soldiers. The surviving Union soldiers ran forward, cut off from retreat by the artillery, and ran into the Confederate infantry sitting behind that stone wall. Lee did not let the Confederate defenders relent. He continued to feed reinforcements to the Confederate soldiers at the wall. So many men were called that at some point they stood six men deep waiting to move up and fire. Burnside didn't back down either, sending in 15 brigades of men to fight over that wall. Unfortunately, the terrain didn't allow many men at one time, so he could only send a brigade or two, and he slowly fed the meat grinder. The attack lasted from noon until after dark. During that whole time, the Union troops never reached that stone wall. Burnside originally wanted to respond to these circumstances with two more days of assaults. His lieutenants convinced him not to attack. Meanwhile, both sides waited for those two days while the dead and wounded lay in the field between them. There are stories of a person called the Angel of Mary's Heights. It is rumored that a Confederate soldier from South Carolina, a man named Richard Kirkland, would take water and warm clothing over the stone wall to the wounded Union troops lying in the field. Sadly, Kirkland would die at the Battle of Chickamauga in 1863. On the night of December 15th, Burnside retreated back across the Rappahannock, and the battle ended. The losses were steep. The Union had lost 12,653 men, including 1,284 killed, 9,600 wounded, and 1,769 captured or missing. The Confederates fared much better, with only 5,377 men lost. This included 608 killed, 4,116 wounded, and 653 missing or captured. Join us again next time on Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition.